right, let's see if I get some camera light. There we go, fantastic. So welcome to today's live stream program with Streamable Learning and Museum of the Rockies. My name is Angie Weikert. So I'm gonna be your host for today's program. Um, we are here in Bozeman, Montana um, at our museum, which is temporarily closed to the public. And we'll show you where that is in just a minute. But before we get started, I wanna tell you a couple important things to know about the platform that we're using, which is Zoom. There's two ways that you can interact with us today. Uh, the first one is the chat box, which you all have been using to let me know where you're tuning in from and what grade you're in. So go ahead and use that chat box. Um, we may ask you a question during the presentation. You can type your answer into that chat box and I'll read off as many as we can. If you have a question, use the Q&A section of Zoom. That Q&A area will let me keep up with the questions and ask them to Jordy, who's gonna present to us today. So use that Q&A area for questions and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, in just a minute, uh, I'll introduce you to Jordy, who's our presenter. But before we do that, I wanted to let you know where we are. Let me get this started up here. So um, we are in the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. This, this pinpoint on the map is where our traveling exhibit is from. Uh, we have an exhibit called Reptiles, the Beautiful and the Deadly, and it comes to us from Allenwood, Pennsylvania. So there on the map is Allenwood. If we zoom into Montana, you can see a pinpoint there where Bozeman is. So we've got quite a few Montana folks tuning in today. We are in the Gallatin Valley here, just north of Yellowstone National Park. And here's a picture of the outside of our museum. Uh, go ahead and use that chat box. What is that creature that is greeting you on the way into our building? Can you use that chat box to tell me what kind of animal uh, you see there outside of the Museum of the Rockies? It is a nice day in Bozeman. Our grass is not that green yet. A bunch of people coming in saying T-Rex. Are they correct? You got it. Great job. Yeah, that is a T-Rex greeting you outside of our building. Uh, Museum of the Rockies is well known for its paleontology collections. Uh, we are going inside the building today, though, to see the exhibit that we're standing in now, Reptiles, the Beautiful and the Deadly. This exhibit is here through September 13th. We are excited to be opening back up to the public here at the end of the month. You can visit our website for details as we um, are able to post those. And when we do open back up, we hope you come in and see us and see this fantastic exhibit from Clyde Peeling's Reptiland. Here is a picture of where we're standing at right now. So we are inside the exhibit. This is an aerial view of that exhibit. Um, and we're kind of tucked over to the left side there. So when you first enter to the right, you may see some turtles. We talked about those a couple weeks ago. Today, we're talking about lizards. So I'd like to introduce you to our presenter for, the, for today, Jordy. Jordy has been taking care of these animals here at Museum of the Rockies for a couple months. Um, and today we're gonna learn all about lizards. So Jordy, thanks so much for joining us. No problem. So yeah, as stated, my name is Jory. I am a zookeeper from Clyde Peeling's Reptland. You guys can happily call me Zookeeper Jory. And we are gonna talk about lizards today. Now, if you guys have seen any of our, our uh, previous lectures, kind of let us know if you have been here before, seen our other lectures, because that'll be important. I'll be <laughs> quizzing you in just a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me, clear my throat. There we go. So uh, we are uh, gonna be talking about lizards today. We're standing right here in the reptiles exhibit. We have about 15 different species of reptiles ranging from crocodilians to lizards, to turtles, to snakes. We have a little bit of, of everything. If anybody who is coming in from Pennsylvania has been to Clyde Peeling's Reptland, you're gonna recognize a good chunk of the little uh, displays that we have here in this exhibit because this is practically Clyde Peeling's Reptland, only a little bit smaller, but designed to travel. So we have a good chunk of animals for you guys to check out here at this exhibit. Um, this is actually gonna be the last lecture I'm gonna be talking uh, about. And actually, I'm only gonna be here for a few more days. I've been here for the last four months taking care of these animals all by myself every single day of the week, waking up about eight or nine o'clock in the morning, taking care of these animals. So when you guys come back, when the museum's open, it's not gonna be me you're gonna see, unfortunately, but you are gonna see the lovely Nate, and he's gonna be a great person to ask any questions that you may have. But enough about the exhibit, we got a lot to talk about. So we're gonna start by talking about the reptiles, specifically, what is a reptile? So 
if any of you guys have uh, been to some of our lectures, we have covered this a little bit, so I'm not going to go too in depth, but I'll go a little bit with a quiz, which is number one, what does the term ectothermic mean? Put that in the chat, type away real quick. What does the term ectothermic mean? All right, use that chat box. I will read off as many as I can here. Ectothermic. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big word here. It is. We have a couple, a couple folks that are excited to learn what that means. All right. Uh, let's wait for a few more answers. Use that chat box. What does ectothermic mean? You've got a few that say cold-blooded, gets warm from the environment. That's exactly it. So ectothermic is breaking down. Ecto means outside and thermic means temperature. So they have to get their internal body temperature from the environment around them. Now we are endothermic. We are warm blooded, which means we generate our own body heat. And because of that, we have to eat two or three times a day just to stay healthy, just to stay alive, to keep up our energy because we're burning so much of it staying nice and warm. Cold blooded reptiles well, are cold blooded and they don't have to eat as much as us because they are getting all their energy from the environment around them, from basking in a nice warm sun, or maybe they have to cool down in a pool, uh, in a nice cool pool if they need to kind of relax or calm down a little bit. But ectothermic means warm or cold blooded. Now, next question. If we look over to our right, we're going to see that adorable baby little wood turtle, which I could spend all day talking about. Our baby little wood turtle hatching out of an egg. What is the technical term for hatching out of an egg or birth from hatching out of an egg? Here's a hint. It starts with O. So what is the technical term for hatching out of an egg? Use that chat box. We are looking for a word that starts with an O that means hatching out of an egg. If you don't know it, that's perfectly all right. This is pretty advanced stuff right here. But if you do know it, great, fantastic. But if you don't know it, don't worry. I'll teach you in just a moment. You, I think you're teaching us some new terms today, Jordy. Okay. We got, you're, you're stopping quite a few of us. Okay. Maybe open? So the term for, uh, for an egg birthing species is oviparous. So ova means egg, paris means birth. So all reptiles hatch out of an egg, like our little wood turtle is happening right there. So they are, uh, their egg is developed inside the female. The female digs a hole, lays the eggs, and most of the time, especially with the reptiles, like the lizards we're gonna be talking about today, they lay the eggs, they walk away, there's almost no parental care. But every single reptile hatches out of an egg. And then finally, I'm not going to ask any kind of complicated question here. The final trait that makes a reptile a reptile, other than being endothermic or cold-blooded or oviparous or hatching from an egg, you also, every single reptile has scales, also sometimes called scutes. And these scales give them a lot of protection on the outside of their body. If you guys look closely, you can see I am covered in hair on my arms. Well, reptiles are kind of the same way, but instead of having hair on top of their skin, they have scales made out of the same material as your fingernails. So it's like if you were a reptile, you would have all of your finger fingernails covering your entire body. And having that gives you a ton of natural protection from the environment around you and potentially even from predators in certain other species of reptile. Now that is the three traits that make up a reptile. Now we're going to jump into the real, real meat of this lecture and we're gonna talk about lizards. Now, we are gonna, uh, looking at this family tree right here, if you uh, saw my previous lectures in the past, we've talked about how crocodilians are among some of the oldest of the reptiles out there and they're very close related to dinosaurs, which makes their closest living relative the birds. The of you, uh, we also talked about how turtles and tortoises are part of the same group of turtles, and they are also really, really old and been around for a long time. <clears throat> we talked about previously in the past the tuateras, and once again, we're not really going to talk about the tuateras that much because they are incredibly endangered, they are incredibly rare, and there's only two species left on the entire planet, and they are found in, uh, uh, in New Zealand. Now, tuateras look just like a lizard, but there is a lot of tiny things that are different about them that makes them not a lizard, but an ancient ancestor of the lizards. 
Then last out of the week, some one of the other weeks, we talked about snakes and how snakes are part of the group known as the squamates. And the squamates make up the lizards and the snakes. And I said that snakes are in a way really well adapted lizards. And we talked a little bit about what makes a snake a snake, but now it's time to talk about what makes a lizard a lizard. Or more importantly, what is the difference between a lizard and a snake? If they're one and the same, what is the biggest difference between the, between the two? Now, put in the chat right now what you think are one of the many traits that separates a snake from a lizard. Real quick, just we'll give it a couple of moments. What are what some of the traits that separate a lizard from a snake? All right, use that chat box. What makes a snake different <clears throat> from a lizard? Take a look at those pictures, see if you can give us a guess. I'll give you a couple minutes to use that chat box and make sure everybody has the chance to type something in there. Now this can be a little tricky and that is perfectly okay. We've got some good responses coming in here. Okay, let's start reading some of these off. We've got no legs, snakes mm -hmm. don't have legs, mm -hmm. snakes don't have feet. Um, snakes are, are carnivores, um, shells and scales, tongues, uh, snakes shed their skin, but lizards don't. A snake has scales, eyelids, ear holes, snake is thinner. So these are all excellent, excellent, uh, excellent guesses on what the difference between them are. Now let me cover a couple of them real quick. One, a lot of people are saying the difference between a lizard and a snake is the legs. And that's not quite actually accurate because, as we'll talk about a little bit later, there are actually legless lizards. So the difference isn't the number of legs. It's also not necessarily their appetite. Now, now most snakes or every snake is carnivorous, and there are a lot of lizards that do eat meat, but there's also a ton of them that do eat fruits and vegetables or even both meat and fruits and vegetables. So it's not necessarily what they eat, but I did hear a couple of ones that were right on the nose, and one of them is their eyes or eyelids or lack of eyelids. Now, it's really hard to tell from this picture that you're looking at right now that the snake does not have any eyelids. The snake is on the right. It is a giant Madagascar hognose snake. He does not have eye or eyelids. Instead, she has a clear scale that covers her eyeball completely, called an eye cap. Whereas the lizard on the right, or on the left, which is Pabst, or uh, our, uh, our rhinoceros iguana, the rhinoceros iguana does have eyelids, and that allows them to blink. It's kind of what gives lizards kind of a more expressive quality. It's how you can sort of relate to the expression of a lizard a little bit more. They have those eyelids that help kind of keep their eyeballs nice and moist. Another one is the ears or the lack thereof. Every single snake you've ever seen in your entire life is completely deaf. They have no ear openings, while almost every single lizard does have ear openings. There's always an exception in some of these rules, but with lizards, they all have ear holes that allow them to hear really, really well. So they do have a good sense of hearing. They do can blink. And then finally, the final difference between them is their jaw structure. If, we were, if you remember from our lecture about snakes, snakes are able to separate their jaws at the chin and articulate or disarticulate at the hinges, allowing them to swallow massive meals. Lizards can't do that. Even though they do have very wide throats and they can swallow large things, sometimes they still have to chew their food to make it a little bit easier to eat. So they do do a little bit more crushing and more chewing with their jaws. So that's the three biggest differences between a lizard and a snake. Now we are going to talk a little bit about our what we have in this collection because I can't talk about everything there is to know about lizards. Lizards are incredibly, incredibly diverse. Uh, just from this picture alone, you can see that there's a lot of different shapes you can have. You have the frog-eyed uh, gecko up there on the top left. You have a night anole, which is a close relative of the green anole. I remember somebody saying they uh, love those species of lizard. But night anoles on the bottom left. And then on the right, we have a frilled lizard. All of them are very similar in structure, but they're all very different. The uh, anoles are going to like to eat a mix of fruits and uh, and meat, like insects. That gecko only wants to eat insects, and that frilled dragon likes to eat things like small mammals and small birds as well. So, but that is just touching on a little bit. So, to help us focus today, we're going to talk only about the lizards that we see specifically on this exhibit, starting with what I believe to be the. Uh, 
Skinks, I knew that was what was correct. So skinks are a really cool species of lizard. Here on this exhibit, we have an Australian blue tongue skink. They are a species of lizard that are found very low to the ground because if you go look, you can see that he has very short, stumpy little legs. Most skinks are going to be terrestrial, meaning they spend all their time on the ground, under logs, under rocks, eating mostly a lot of insects. They do like to eat, as you can see there, little salads of fruits, vegetables, and greens. Now what's really cool about blue tongue skinks particularly is they have a massive broad head that is specialized for eating things like snails. So they can bite onto the shell, crush it, and swallow the shell whole in addition to all the juicy, yummy innards of the snail as well. Then they also have that blue tongue. Now, to type in the chat real quick, why do you think a blue tongue skink has a blue tongue in the first place? What is useful about that? Ooh, while they're typing in what they think is useful about that tongue, could you tell us where this species of skink lives? Yes. So uh, blue tongue skinks are found in the Australian area of the, well, Australia. Um, there is about four or five different species spread across the entire continent. There are some other uh, um, very close related cousins on the islands uh, around Australia as well. But you can also find skinks in our own backyard. Coal skinks are very common. Uh, five line skinks are also very common in different parts of the United States. So skinks are very common. Uh, now, blue tongue skinks are very large. They're over a foot long, where all the skinks you're gonna find in your own backyard are gonna be maybe three or four inches at most. So skinks can be found all over the planet. Great, we have wonderful answers coming in about what they use that tongue for. We have lure, lure, camouflage, it scares predators, it helps them eat better. Um, poison, question mark, help smell. All, all fantastic, all fantastic guesses and all fantastic answers. The correct answer is that it is a giant threat to tell any predator to come, that if they come anywhere nearby, they're going to kill them dead but that's not actually the case. They have no poison, they have no venom whatsoever. Instead, that blue tongue is brightly colored. In the world of reptiles and a lot of insects, bright colors mean danger, means an animal is venomous or poisonous. And that bright flash of blue, if a predator sees it, is going to immediately know, ah, this animal is dangerous and fly away. But again, this is a trick. It is simply just meant there to scare off any predators that try to get a little bit too close. Now, if we're going to talk about skinks, there is the one thing I want to talk about real quickly, and that is that some skinks that are, or some lizards that are really close related to skinks are actually considered legless lizards. Now, these legless lizards look very much like snakes, as you can see there, and it's really hard to tell, but we know this is a lizard because, one, he does not have that flexible jaw structure that snakes have, and also they have eyelids. So this lizard that you're looking at right now can blink. Another common name for legless lizards is a glass snake, and that's because a lot of skinks have this ability that if a predator grabs, excuse me, if a predator grabs them by the tail, there you can suddenly and without pain detach their tail from their body. And in a lot of skink species, they can regrow this tail. In the case of legless lizards, when they are uh, legless lizards or glass snakes, when a uh, predator is grabbing onto them, the tail will break off, making it almost appear like they broke like glass. So that is where that name came from. So moving on to the next group of lizards that we have on the exhibit, we have our iguanas with our handsome, lovely uh, 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 Paps, the rhinoceros iguana that we have on display here. Iguanas are big lizards. Paps is probably about three or four feet long. He is probably closer to be about 20 or 25 pounds heavy. And he mostly loves his fruits and vegetables and his greens and everything like that. But on occasion in the wild, he would eat some things like small mammals or uh, uh, birds and such like that. Now, iguanas are pretty widespread around the tropical regions. You're not going to find an iguana casually walking around your backyard. But if you've been to a pet store, you've probably seen green iguanas. They are very common out there in the world. Um, uh, they're very common in, uh, the, they're originally from South America, but if you go down to Florida, you're going to see green iguanas all over the place. And that's because they're actually invasive. They're not native there. Even though as cool as they are, they are not native to Florida. So green iguanas are the ones that are big. They're green. They have elaborate crests. They have long tails, giant dewlaps that make them look big and intimidating. 
and they will eat a lot more meat than fruits and vegetables in the wild as well. And as all iguanas are, they do have attitudes, especially male iguanas. They will try to fight each other to the death, or if they think you're a threat on their territory, they will attack you and they do have strong, strong fights. So iguanas may look cool and friendly, but they're not necessarily going to be your best friend. So, Jordy, you talked about a green iguana. Yes. What are the different colors of iguanas? <clears throat> And what else? So there's lots of different uh, um, kind of colors out there. There's actually, if we uh, uh, look at the, it, there's lots of different iguana species. Not all of them are green. Not all of them are big. Um, the curly tail iguana is rather small and can also be found in Florida and is also invasive. You also have the desert iguanas, which are very brown and a little bit smaller and kind of covered in specks, uh, uh, black specks all over their body. Then you've got obviously our rhino iguanas and our rock iguanas, which we'll talk about in a little bit in a moment. Now, another thing you might see uh, on uh, occasion is a yellow iguana or a blue iguana. Both of them are simply fancy breeds or fancy raised uh, uh, or fancy genetic green iguanas that people have had as pets that have bred in order to have nice colorations. But typically, the colors of iguana you're going to see are the green iguana, which are the true iguanas. Their scientific name is Iguana Iguana. Um, and then you have the other iguanas that are typically going to be a little bit more brownish or grayish in coloration, like what we're going to talk about next, which is specifically... We have two more questions. Okay. Um, how, this is a picture of the iguana that's here at the Museum of the Rockies right now. Yes. How old is that iguana? So that individual is about, oh, I believe he is 16, I'm if I'm remembering correctly. It's been a while since I've looked at his information, but he is a younger individual. Iguanas can live to be about 50 or 60, so he's still a little bit on the younger side. And the second question about this iguana is, uh, do they shed their skin? Yes, so I should have covered that a little bit earlier. Yes. All lizards shed their skin, but not the same way snakes will. Now with uh, turtles, they'll usually shed in patches. In crocodilians, they'll also shed in little bits and pieces. Lizards typically shed in giant patches over their body. In fact, Paps is, is, as most rock iguanas are, always in a constant state of shedding her, his skin. When you come and see him, you're going to see patches of, patches of him that look very brown and kind of gray. Some of that is old skin that is slowly peeling away. Some of it that's bluer in coloration is his newer skin underneath. Another really cool thing about the lizards, though, is when they shed their skin, they'll actually eat their own skin because you don't want to waste all that extra uh, pro protein and nutrition. They'll eat the shed skin, unlike snakes, which will just leave them wherever the heck they are. So iguana specifically, what we have on display and what we have at Clyde Peeling's Reptland are considered rock iguanas. They are part of the genus Cyclura. So the scientific names are Cyclura nublia and Cyclura forgetting the other scientific name, but they are rock iguanas. And rock iguanas are an endangered species that are found down in the West Indies, which are part of the, uh, the part area in the Caribbean, or in the Caribbean seas. But the West in Indies, almost every single one of their islands has an individual uh, iguana on that species. The one on the left is a Cuban rock iguana. The one on the right is Paps back at the zoo in Reptiland, who is a rhinoceros iguana. All of them are found on different islands. All of them are facing a lot of threats because they are commonly hunted and eaten. They are a very uh, a common source of meat down there. So uh, they, they are probably my favorite groups of uh, iguanas to talk about because they are so cool. They are very large. They are a little bit more intimidating and they're not quite as brightly colored like the green iguanas are. So talking about the next group of lizards, we have the Gila monsters. Now these are probably my favorite of all of the lizards. Gila monsters are one of the few venomous lizards on this planet. But Gila monster, or the Gila monster we have on this display, I'm not sure how old he is. He doesn't have a name, but he loves to spend all day and sleep and sleep and sleep. These guys are not a tree dwelling lizard species. In fact, I would almost call them a subterrestrial species of lizard because their favorite thing to do is to crawl under logs and crawl in between rock crevices. If you come into our exhibit and you see our, uh, our uh, Gila monster, you might notice that he looks like he is completely stuck. He has wedged himself in between two rocks or under a stick or kind of in between two rocks. I promise you he is not stuck. He is perfectly capable of getting himself out. This is just what Gila monsters do. These guys are a carnivorous species of lizard that spends a lot of time low to the ground, but they'll kind of slowly walk their way around looking for things like 
bird nests or uh, mouse dens, and they will just gobble up juvenile rodents and juvenile birds, as well as the eggs that they find there as well. So these guys are not very fast moving. They're not very, not typically extremely aggressive, and they're uh, typically just gonna wander around and try to gobble down any food that they want. Now they are venomous, and if you remember back from our snake uh, lecture that we did, snakes generate venom through giant glands at the top of their mouths. That's not the case with lizards. Instead, the venom is all generated in their saliva. So he has serrated teeth. So when he bites into his prey, he's gonna bite and chew and chew and chew and chew and chew and chew and work his saliva nice and deep to help weaken the animal to make it easier for them to eat. Now there are other venomous lizards in the world. There's not that many, but there is about two primary species that we know as, as medically significantly venomous. And that is the Gila monster. And I want you, if you know, to type in the chat what you think that other medically significant venomous reptile lizard is. There's the Gila monster, and there's another one that looks very similar to a Gila monster. Now the one you're seeing on display is one that I like to talk about because it has been con uh, or kind of been debated in the scientific field for decades. It is the Komodo dragon, one of the most handsome and the largest lizards in the world. They can grow to be about nine feet long and close to about 80 to 100 pounds. They are massive predators that take down large prey. Now, like I said, it's been debated whether these guys are venomous or not. A big, uh, the one, they eat a lot of necrotic flesh or a lot, not a lot of dead animals. So their saliva already has a little bit of bacteria. And it's always been uh, suggested that their mouths are so bacteria ridden that one bite leads to infection. And that's not truly venomous. But there's not really a lot of evidence to suggest that. Instead, their saliva has that venom protein, but it's not quite medically significant. Their venom doesn't help weaken the prey. Instead, it acts like an anticoagulant, meaning that when they bite, the wound can't heal. It can, the blood can't clot, the wound can't heal, and the animal essentially bleeds out. So again, I talk about the Komodo dragon simply because it could be venomous, it might not be, but a lot of evidence right now suggesting that they are truly venomous, just not medically significant. So what do we think? Komodo dragon were your responses. You'll have to teach us. That is a good one. So like I said, we think the Komodo dragon could be venomous, but no, the only other one that is truly medically significantly venomous is the Mexican beaded lizard. And they look just like a heel monster, only they're slightly bigger and their scales have more of a rounded appearance. So they look a little beaded. So the Mexican beaded lizard and the Gila monster are the two primary venomous lizards in the world, while there's a debate whether the Komodo dragons are venomous or not. So then finally, the last group we're gonna talk about is the, no, we have two more. What am I talking about? <laughs> Got a lot to talk about. So chameleons, they are an absolutely alien species of lizard. And when you think of things that are, are crazy and seem like they're out of this world, chameleons are right there. They have so many things that are different compared to them compared to all the other lizards. For one, they have five toes, but their toes are fused into the, in, into their toe, their five toes are fused into two little alien mittens or so that allow them to easily grab onto branches. The chameleons also have what is called a prehensile tail, meaning they use their tail to wrap around and hold onto tree branches so they don't fall off. They also have two eyes that can move independently of one another, which may not seem all that cool at first, but I suggest to look in whatever room you're at, look at one thing with one eye, and then look on the other side of the room and try to look at that at the same time. It's not possible, but chameleons are capable of doing that as well. Now we have one chameleon on display. It is a veiled chameleon, and it is a handsome individual, hopefully, when you see him. Um, and then the, uh, the final thing that really makes a chameleon a chameleon is, of course, its color-changing ability. Now if we look at the next slide, we're going to see a, uh, a comparison between the same uh, chameleon. 
This is a panther chameleon, so not quite the same as the veiled chameleon we have on display. And panther chameleons are the greatest example of color changing ability in chameleons. They're the ones that are fully capable of changing their coloration from greens, reds, blues, pinks, yellows. They have lots of different colors they can easily change their color into. The veiled chameleon you see on the display is not going to be that drastic. He can change colors from one bright shade of green to one not so bright shade of green. They are capable of changing their colors, but not quite exaggerately or quite as much as the panther chameleon can. Now, when a, a lot of a big misconception between chameleons is that they change their color based on their environment. That I'm sure we've seen the commercial where it's a chameleon walking around and it touches a, uh, a sample of paint and it turns into that color and then touches another, turns into that color. That's not going to be the case. A chameleon chases its skin not based on its environment, but based on what is happening around it. So if a chameleon is like our veiled chameleon, if he is feeling a very, very confident, very attractive, trying to lure ladies or trying to show off all the other males that he's bigger and better, he's going to be very vibrant in colorations. If he's feeling a little stressed or a little scared, he's going to be very call or pale in coloration. If he's feeling kind of nervous, uh, he might turn into a very darker kind of coloration to blend in. So they won't change their colors based on their environment, but based on the factors and everything that's happening around them. And then finally, because we have so we are we're almost there, we have our final uh, group of animals, the geckos, which are the ones that you are seeing in the display right behind me. Geckos are very diverse. Not all geckos are capable of climbing up glass. We'll talk about that in a little moment. Most of them are going to be purely insectivorous, meaning they only want to eat insects. They can be found all over the planet. You can find some gecko species out in the American Southwest. You can find a lot of geckos in South America and Africa. You can find them in uh, uh, in Asia, some uh, are on the edges or southern edges of Europe. So geckos are pretty widespread. The one we, we have on display here are, are Henkeli leaf tail geckos or frilled leaf tail geckos. They are uh, all leaf tail geckos are only from the island of Madagascar, where they are critically endangered in their environment due to habitat loss from us clearing out the uh, the rainforest for wood and uh, uh, in agricultural use and such like that. So these guys are really cool to have on display because they are critically endangered. And at, back at our zoo in Reptiland, we are really good breeders of these of these species. We breed these regularly to send to other zoos with the hopes that one day the captive population will be so strong we can start releasing them back into the wild. And once their once their environment is protected, we can start really reintroducing them and bring their numbers back up into the wild. Now geckos are able to climb up glass thanks to their specialized toes. The next slide will show us that a close-up on the bottom of a gecko's toe, I'm not sure what species this is, full disclosure, I found this picture online. I don't have a camera good enough to show a good close-up shot of their toes. But on the bottom of every single gecko's toe, or each gecko's toes is a pad. And each pad is made out of ridges. And each ridge is made out of thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny little hairs that are split on the end called spatula. These are not the same thing you use to flip Krabby Patties with. Instead, they are specialized hairs that cling onto a surface at a microscopic level, allowing them to climb up wood, uh, rock. They can climb up glass as well, as we can see from our little guy right here on the glass. So they're capable of climbing up a wide range of surfaces thanks to those specialized toes. But again, not all geckos are gonna have that. If you're familiar with the species that you might see a lot in pet stores or some of your friends have, or even you have, of a leopard gecko, they don't have sticky toe pads. Instead, they have tiny little claws. So not all geckos are gonna have sticky toe pads, but a lot of them will. Geckos don't have eyelids? Geckos do not quite have the same eyelids as other lizards do. So they are capable of kind of pulling their eyeballs back a little bit more, but they cannot fully blink, but they still have to keep their eyeballs nice and moist. And they're able to do that thanks to their specialized tongues that allow them to lick their own eyeballs. It's pretty gross. <laughs> so with that, Oh, that is a quick summary of lizards. That is a quick summary of what we have on this display. Again, I highly recommend you guys coming in and checking out this exhibit. And if you want to learn more about lizards, 
definitely visit your local library, visit uh, uh, um, certain sites online like reptiles.com is always a safe site to go to, but look up more information. Like I said, I only touched on a tiny little bit of the iceberg of lizard information and lizard diversity. But we have a big, big finale for the end of this. This allowed, is now time for me to bring in my little cart that I have off the camera right here. And sure, you've seen my friend here, which when you guys come back, you may be able to see her when we start doing shows again. But this lady right here, can you look at the camera, my dear? Thank you. <laughs> could, you could you back that up just a little yes. bit for me? Perfect, thanks. So this lady right here is a female bearded dragon. Her name is Lady Beard. Now, Lady Beard is one of our education animals. So when you come to the exhibit, you're not going to see her on display. But if you come to one of our shows or lectures, you might see her. She's going to help us to learn about lizards in live. Uh, now, when the, zoo, or the museum does open once again, full disclosure, you won't be allowed to touch her because uh, in Montana, you're not allowed to contact or uh, have contact with education animals, unfortunately. But you can get up close and take a good look at her. But that's not why we brought her out. I like to have a big finale for these kind of things. So today we are going to be feeding this bearded dragon. What we're going to be feeding her, stashed under here. Let's see if I can get up in front of the camera here. So what we have here are these lovely, it's not well, so. Yeah, if you hold it still, it may zoom in. We there can we see it moving. Okay, so cool. what I have in my hands <laughs> that the camera cannot detect is right there is a super worm. We've got about six of these things for her to eat. These guys are the larva of a species of beetle that are commonly fed upon here uh, uh, in the exhibit and uh, in reptile collections in general. And since uh, the bearded dragons are a species that will eat both fruits and vegetables, they also love to eat insects. She's going to get some tasty insects. So. Again, let's see. You want to back her up just a little bit there too. The cart. Yep, there you go. All go. right, let's see what she eats. She's going for it. There you go. <laughs> so you can see that she is using her tongue quite a bit. Now she's not you gonna uh, doesn't have an incredibly long tongue. Her tongue is simply uh, kind of a little bit more stickier, and she'll use it to grab onto prey and kind of bring it into her mouth a little better. She's very, mo if you guys have ever seen the movie Jurassic Park, and uh, they talk about how the T-Rex has uh, eyesight based on movement, that's very similar to Lady Beard here. If it's moving, she's gonna be interested. <laughs> Can you move a little bit more, my dear? So while she is enjoying these with our last few minutes, oh, do we have, are we out of time? Are we? Um, let's let's uh, put two more questions in okay. while she's eating and then we'll be all wrapped up. Absolutely. Um, so somebody asked about, you used the word tame, right? So our, our pets that, um, our animals that we can have as pets are tame. How do you tame a lizard? So when, uh, when I say tame, I don't necessarily mean this mean tame. That was a more of a slip of the term. Um, so reptiles aren't capable of becoming, say, domesticated. They're not going to be like dogs or cats. They're not going to become your best friend. They might get excited to see you, but not because they love you, but because they think you're bringing food. So with certain species, though, are going to be naturally a little bit more docile than others. Bearded dragons are naturally very lazy animals that like to lay around. Even in the wild, if you found a wild bearded dragon, it's probably just going to be laying on a rock, sunning itself, and if it sees you, it's going to run away. They're not naturally aggressive. Some of our other animals that we use for education are all ball pythons, and they're the same way. They are naturally docile. In contrast, you're never going to see me using our iguana for educational purposes because they can have an attitude change where suddenly they go from being your best friend to suddenly being you are their worst enemy. So it's really hard to uh, hard to predict that sometimes. But yeah, there is no such thing as a tame reptile. They're always going to be wild animals. They're always going to have a different kind of reaction than what a cat or dog would be. But some of them do make excellent pets like bearded dragons, like leopard geckos, like bull pythons. They are all fantastic starter reptiles um, that are easy to take care of and are very relaxed and docile animals. Um, our last question, this is a good relevant one for right now. How is that bearded dragon swallowing that little worm whole? It looks like they have teeth to chew it. <laughs> 
They do have teeth and she will crush a little bit, but overall she just swallows it whole. She just has a large uh, esophagus. She is capable of crushing things. I do give her things like grapes and apples and little bits of bell pepper, and she will get those, chew it a little bit to make it softer to swallow. But with the, uh, the a lot of the insects, she will crush real quickly, like one crush to kind of get it to stop moving, and then she'll swallow it whole. Great. Um, could you end this by telling us again how many lizards are in Absolutely. this exhibit? How many how the other reptiles in general? Yes. So we have about 15 different species of reptile on this exhibit. The lizards we have on display are frill or are, uh, are, uh, leaf-tailed geckos, gila monsters, are, uh, rhinoceros iguana, and chameleons. Uh, then we also have a couple of crocodilians, like a dwarf crocodile that's about five feet long. We have a couple of snakes. We have some uh, venomous ones like the gaboon viper, a western diamondback rattlesnake. We have some garter snakes. We also have some turtles, like an alligator snapping turtle and a softshell turtle. So we have a little bit of everything when it comes to the reptile world. Fantastic. Well, with that, I'm going to put up a um, URL for you to go visit if you'd like to learn more. This has been a great program, Jordy. Thanks so much no for problem. telling us all about lizards, for being here um, and keeping our animals safe while the museum's been temporarily closed. For those of you that want to tune in to a few more programs, we have four left before the end of the school year here from Museum of the Rockies. Um, we have our Fossil Fridays focused on dinosaurs. Tomorrow's program is for first through fourth graders looking at um, famous dinosaurs from our exhibits. Um, and on Monday, we'll be talking about homesteading, which is great here in Montana for that fourth grade age group. You can visit museumoftherockies.org slash learn to see more programs, see Jordy's previous videos um, and wonderful content uh, for all of us here at Museum of the Rockies and Streamable Learning. Thanks so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day.